Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, lovely weather out, out, outside. I'm happy you still came, came in. There's, a, there's actually pretty few for those who aren't uh, from London. If you want to take pictures, I already did to send to the family. Um, that direction is pretty nice. <laughs> but um, done with holiday pictures. Um, let's talk a little bit about development, containers, <coughs> applications. So I'll postulate that every company is a technology company. And uh, by that, I don't mean the typical technology companies. I really mean every company. Um, for example, my dermatologist or booksellers, the most famous. What's, who is the most famous bookseller these days? <laughs> Amazon, yeah. Um, I mean, they started as a bookshop. They sell a lot more, but they still sell a lot of books. Um, it's actually what we do at SUSE is uh, falls pretty much there. And when we, when we say technology, obviously companies or entities will always have customers, employees. You work with partners. You have some supply. You have a supply chain from electricity over pieces, et cetera. So that's not, going to, that's not going to change. But how we interact with those, that's actually, that's actually changing. For example, a reason I picked the der dermatologist I am, or, or a hairdresser, in fact, is, and, and yes, I still go to a hairdresser, um, is because they have an online booking system. I travel, I travel a fair bit across time zones. Um, and during the day, it's not always easy to make phone calls or I'm in a different country and what, whatever. So I don't think of, of, of making an appointment. Um, and then when I think about it, they're closed. So I can't call them even if I, don't, if I would want to. So the fact that they have an online booking system that actually allows me to pick, to pick a doctor and a time slot, that's super valuable to me. And that's why I picked that one and, and not the other one. Just, just one example. Um, Amazon obviously is, is a really famous example, um, but also in, in, in the case of SUSE, what we do, we are an open source company. So we have lots of developers, but much of our development <coughs> is happening with open source communities. Some where we are a small participant, some where we actually are a leader in, in that community, and some that center around our products, like we have OpenSUSE, which is a community version of, of a Linux distro. Um, and what we found is in those communities that we engage in or that, that we host some even, how we interact with them, driven by technology, driven by tools, applications, is actually key, can be key to success, can be key to how many contributions we get, how fast the project evolves. So part of what we actually have been doing over time is not just developing, packaging, open source software, but really also develop tooling specifically for interacting with the different constituencies. Because um, since we, we started to realize that technology is not, not just something that we sell and support, so it's not just our product, but it's really very integral how, you act, how to actually build technology. Um, and this is just, just one example. I'm, I'm seeing this uh, with most customers that I visit. I'm seeing this with many, most partners, especially the, those that are successful, is um, seeing technology and the way to, uh, to develop, in our case, its software, um, as, as a true differentiation, not just something that you have to do, not just you have you run a payroll, you do this and that, you run the order system, but it really, the way we interact and everything in my, my experience becomes more connected, more connected and faster, um, that is material. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, Gerald, I'm Gerald Pfeiffer. Gerald, as you pronounce it in English, I'm uh, I'm CTO at SUSE. 
based in EMEA, not just responsible for EMEA, but based here. In, in the past 10 years, I actually have been running the products function at SUSE, so the, the portfolio. If you, think, if you think about us, if you think of SUSE, you probably think, think of two or three things. One is the color green. Uh, two is our logo, which is a chameleon. Um, which, by the way, we brought this, and since the show is going to end tomorrow, uh, we are giving away this chameleon. And there's another one here that we're happy to give away. And since we didn't know how to, how to um, decide who gets the chameleon, what we agreed is uh, we'll, we'll distribute the big chameleon and this one to people asking questions. So let's keep this interactive. And my, there's two colleagues of mine in the room, and they will help me decide what is an interesting question. <laughs> That's, and then you can tell us which of the chameleons you want. Um, yeah, and the third thing when you think of SUSE probably is Linux, because we are, we are like the oldest enterprise Linux company uh, in, in the world. So we, we actually started enterprise Linux to begin with. Um, however, however, the green hasn't changed, the chameleon hasn't changed, the Linux part has changed. We're now doing a lot more than Linux over the last years. Since we started to see more and more the trend all, also in our own use cases, um, we internally underwent a transition, how we develop software, how we, how we interact with partners, for example, how we interact with customers, um, adopting more and more agile methodologies, but also if, at the portfolio that I helped build out over the last years, we actually have, have now um, quite some focus on applications and application delivery. So not just for what we do, how, how we build applications in support, um, of, of what we do, but sharing, sharing that um, in form of products and services with others. Talking about applications um, and, you know, starting from Linux, which originally was an application platform. You know, you had your command line and your shell, and that's how you, that's, that's how you develop the applications, and people still are doing that. It's just, depending on what you need, it's just not the most effective way it's not, uh, not for maximal productivity. Um, but one thing that's really has been and still is important is stability. The, whatever you do, um, even if it's fancy and colorful, even if it's super agile, if you start losing your data, if you can't book an appointment, if you cannot check in people for a flight, and I've, I've been part of a scenario where it happened because there was a problem in an application. It was a big airline and all their check-in kiosks were not working for two, two and a half hours. Globally, I can tell you, people lose jobs over that. That's not a happy thing, even if only if it's two hours. Um, so no matter what stability, quality, resilience, availability, all those factors, are still important. However, there is more, has been more and more asking, crying, uh, demanding for agility. So we're um, IT, application development, we need to be faster, more responsive to needs of the business. We can't have cycle times of years or months, sometimes even, even weeks or days, sometimes and more and more we need to respond faster. And, and one way to do that is um, leveraging new technologies, but also new development methodologies. So when we talk about application delivery, number one is streamline ap application development um, and deployment. That is applications we have already that are in active development. How can we be faster about churning about churning them? How can we be better about adding things, adjusting things? Um, like if you're WhatsApp and there's a big security gap, um, or if you're, uh, to, just to use public examples, um, or if you're Firefox and because you don't renew your, some of your certificates, you, lock all, you, you block all extensions running in a web browser, then you really want to be able to get out updates 
very, very quickly. Um, but also, if you have the luxury to do so, and you can create a project from scratch, how do you go about that? And more often than not these days, it's about one keyword tiers cloud native applications. So if you don't have any legacy, but if you can just say, okay, we can start with zero lines of code, we can start with a fresh architecture, how, how do we go about that? Um, definitely with startups, but, but also with bigger companies, what I'm seeing is uh, cloud native is, is, is the choice for, for many reasons. But, and it brings a change in how we develop software. When I joined SUSE, and we did Linux, and to some extent it's still the case because there's a lot of partners, lots of hardware partners, lots of QA cycles involved. This is how we did software. We had a release cycle of um, doing a release every 12 months. And so one release was in the works for about every 18 months from the planning and then getting input from the partners and then they schedule their things and we schedule our things. Um, which in a way has been working well, but clearly is not sufficient if you, if you want to churn, th churn things a lot faster. Just out of curiosity, who of you in, in your companies or your day jobs, who of you still has has an, a, a waterfall approach, not necessarily in your team, but in some other teams close by. So I see, I, I would say, two thirds raising, raising their hands. And in a way, this has been serving as well, but like many things, there, there comes a time where you wonder, is there a better approach? Um, and so when we talk cloud native apps, what, what we're actually looking at, and that, even that is a simplified picture, but we're looking at, at microservices and how we structure, so it's not a big monolithic thing. It's different components of an application that move, at their own, move develop at their own speed. We just, <laughs> and it's a big, uh, question, that's a big um, quote, we just need to make sure the pieces that come together in the different lanes and speeds, actually when they integrate in operations, also work together. So topics like uh, CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment um, are really key and, and uh, approaches, soft approaches like DevOps. So that, that's what matters here. And that's obviously a simplified approach because here you may have cycles and you may have rollbacks and whatnot. But the idea is to go from big and slow to, to smaller and agile and then integrate Integrate So release early, release often is actually one of the mantras from the open source arena that we have seen. Um, and it applies to, to applications as well. However, to make things a little bit more complicated, in addition to the current applications you develop, um, in, in addition to the clean room luxury approach of being able to go cloud native, there is also legacy applications that you may not be able to touch. They may be written in COBOL. Uh, the development team may be very small um, or it just may be a desire not to touch it because it's, it's 28 years into its life cycle and only has two years left and only few users, but we still want to keep. So we also have to take into account those legacy applications um, as we go. And uh, yeah. I think uh, a few years ago, the promise was magically we use cloud. And first it was public cloud and, and then private cloud. We use cloud and all problems will go away. And I will argue cloud is part of the answer, but only part of the answer, not the whole answer. And then like three years ago, three and a half or so, maybe four, containers became the answer to all the questions. You know, whatever your problem is, use containers and, uh, and, and we'll solve those problems. However, it's not quite that easy because if you look at, at where applications run, how we develop them, there's actually different layers. The first one is where do you actually, where do you run this stuff in, in terms of physically where? Do you run it in your own data center? Do you run it at a vendor, hosted, managed, 
or do you run it in some sort of public cloud? Um, then the question is, okay, this is the data, this is the postal address where it runs if you want, but in what form factor do you run it? Could be a physical server, could be a virtual server, could be containers, um, obviously running on virtual servers or directly physical servers. Um, and alongside with that, that, as we have seen a little bit, is the question of how is the architecture of the application. Is it monolithic? Then for quite a while it was multi-tiered. Um, now I think there is a trend going more and more into microservices. Um, and last but not least, what I call a human factor process. How do we actually go about developing the development process? For waterfall, agile, uh, and really reaching into DevOps, where you planned the delivery of application and the operations. So you remove the wall in between um, development uh, of an application and then um, the infrastructure. And I will argue, if you look at what's, what's fancy or what's where the f direction directionally, that we're looking more into DevOps or at least agile processes, microservices, architecture, running in containers on some sort of cloud, could be public, private. But really, and, and you know, two thirds of, of you raising your arms a little earlier, I take as a strong indication and it matches my experience that really nearly all of that is still happening. And it makes sense. I'm not saying this is good and this is bad. It's just, it's one of those evolutions. Um, actually, the look, and even, even here in the UK, I think most cars are still driven with a stick shift. Like there's not a lot of automated cars, which personally I don't understand. I can drive a stick shift because I learned. I killed the engine many times in my first, uh, in my first attempts. Now it, now it just works in my brain. Um, but if I were to design a car from scratch, from a user perspective, this is, this is clearly the, the automated way is what I would go and, 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 and not, not, not the stick shift. So automation, um, I will argue, is really, if you look at cloud scale, if you look at agility, is really automation that we need. And automation implies many things. It's the orchestration of, of workloads. So where does your application go? How do you schedule? How do you deploy? How do you actually, when I say deploy, it's not this, this big blob that is self-sufficient. It's, it's one medium-sized blob or multiple smaller blobs that connect because I need a database, I need networking. It's like a spider or a set of spiders in a, in, in a web, an ecosystem. Once you have deployed it, you want to make sure it's actually, you monitor it. So things like um, uh, monitoring, healing if there is a problem, more than forcing high availability. Now it's more about healing and, and resilience comes more from the ability to, to handle problems than to avoid problems, technical problems at any cost. And scaling up and load balancing at all times. And last but not least, especially DevOps, um, Agile being keywords, how do you roll out new versions if in the unlikely, hopeful event, if I need, um, how, do I, how do I roll back? And you know, for a while it looked, or it still looks in, in some quarters, in some ways, that Kubernetes is the answer, answer to all of that. Um, <coughs> If you talked about containers four years ago, three years ago, most of us probably would have come to the word Docker rather quickly. I've usually in conversations on slides, I don't see Docker a lot anymore. Um, Kubernetes is now everywhere. Uh, who of you are familiar with Kubernetes? I assume most of you. Um, so about, it's really two thirds, 70, percent if of people if I look at the data I've, I've got as of today I think 85 in about a year's time when they talk about container deployment it's actually happening around Kubernetes which is a, is a is something Google has donated and that's now hosted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation 
And Kubernetes does all of that and does it very well. Um, so there is, you, there is nothing bad about Kubernetes in, in my mind, and, and we are heavy Kubernetes users. There is only one drawback with Kubernetes, which I can't blame Kubernetes for. Um, Kubernetes actually, and that's, that's, that's not a deficiency in Kubernetes, as in uh, something it should be doing and it doesn't, but it's something it was never designed or intended for. Kubernetes doesn't actually build your application or deploy from source code. So Kubernetes is a really solid and evolving infrastructure that you can run stuff on, but as an application developer, Kubernetes isn't actually the full story because um, it can do everything, like a stick shift can, can do everything, um, like manual systems can do everything, and it does it very, very well. But if you come from an application delivery world, it's actually not pro out of the box, it's not providing all those things that you ideally want to use. And so looking at this from a SUSE perspective, um, and working with, with, with many customers seeing, okay, where do we need to bring things? We actually realized there are two different things. There are two different aspects people, people want. Um, one is what we call the Kubernetes operator experience. So you run an infrastructure. How do you run a container infrastructure? And then um, a developer experience. How do you actually provide optimal service to developers so that they can focus on the application and take the infrastructure for granted? And um, what we ended up doing is actually carving two offerings. One we call the SUSE uh, Container as a Service Platform, which, which provides the best operator experience for Kubernetes. If you want, you could call it Kubernetes in a box or out of a box. Um, and then um, SUSE Cloud Application Platform, which is a platform which focuses on platform as a service. So which solely focuses on um, what, what, uh, what do developers want, what do developers do. Um, so the former, and, and they're actually linked as, I'll, as, as we'll see in two, three minutes. Um, so the former is really a Kubernetes-based container management solution, um, which which you can deploy quickly, which, which has all the resilience built in, which has update mechanisms both for the infrastructure and then the software on top built in and is based on, on, um, uh, on enterprise Linux, which is based on 24 seven support and all those aspects. The other one cloud application platform is actually where we have combined Kubernetes. So it's not an either or, it's actually the clever combination of the two that, that makes sense. And, uh, and key aspects from Cloud Foundry, which is a platform as a service solution, um, to really create the best developer experience. And so what, what, what that brings is, with one step commands, uh, CF push, you can actually containerize your source code, deploy and manage, manage an entire application. So you focus not on, on infrastructure as a developer. You can really focus on just writing a source code. And then with the help of build packs, um, where there's a large number depending on the different programming languages, environments you want to use. And service brokers have, have that piece of source code with a bit of an abstract description connect into, into your infrastructure. So essentially you can you can indicate, okay, I need a database, I need this and that to run this source code. And then you throw everything into, into the magic mill um, that's cloud application platform and it'll build or not if you have like syntax errors then you get an error message. But let's assume everything builds. Um, it will put it in a container, it will deploy and make sure it, it remains deployed. So that includes scaling up, scaling down, um, connecting. Um, the, the whole the whole life cycle management, and this is something uh, some data um, a cloud foundry has uh, we have looked at in in the context of the cloud foundry foundation. Um, what happens when when you employ such an approach 
is an application development cycle changed drastically. So for those people interviewed, only 19%, um, only like 5% roughly, had application uh, cycles of less than a day. And afterwards, it was about 20, 25. Before going for, for such a platform as a service approach, you see here about 25, 20, 25% actually had cycles of six months. And after adopting that, it was like seven, eight in, in that range. Um, because when you can focus on the application and not the infrastructure and not the integration and not the, not the de deployment and not the life cycle, but you can solely focus on what you want the tool to do and then put it into, into the system, um, this is a drastic change you can observe. And it's not just here that you became faster, it also becomes cheaper in terms of, of your time. Time is money, but also time, time in, in, in the context of agility. Or as a developer, you can actually do more because you have to, you have to spend less time putting your fingers into the machinery or pressing the clutch with your left foot. Um, one thing we did, because originally um, the pieces we got from Cloud Foundry had their own stack. So Cloud Foundry did their own stack with, with bits and pieces that were self-sufficient, but it wasn't based on any other open source projects. And so what we did is, and this is a classic approach used in computer science or application development, you actually use layered approaches and you reuse things. So we said, okay, instead of reinventing the wheel and doing an, their, its own container scheduler called Diego, why don't we use Kubernetes? Who of you has heard about Diego? I've, I'm seeing, okay, you, you have. <laughs> but I see one hand, one hand raising virtually is my colleague who has been working in this domain for a long while. So none of you has, have heard about Diego, which actually does something very similar to Kubernetes. Um, and so that's, that's what we actually did. We said, you know what? Let's take something that's proven. Um, let's take something where there's bigger communities for the base levels, including the operating system. So we put enterprise Linux into it. Um, it's the first um, such solution that actually uses enterprise Linux and not just some community distribution where you, where you don't really get 24-7 support. Um, let's use Kubernetes. Let's reduce the memory footprint, and then focus on, on what really the, the developers see. Um, that's, that's now or 100% open source solution, and it's, it, it's fully enterprise grade. With the advantage, um, there is a lot of free use, and we'll see this on, on, on one of the next slides. What we actually did is, um, we used, or we are using, what we are telling um, application developers is a good idea to use containers and container orchestration also for the solution itself. So the very same approach that the applications running on top of it use, we use that very same approach also for the Cloud Foundry pieces, namely make Cloud Foundry run um, itself run as containers on Kubernetes. So this is a good example. There is, there's one thing um, they tell you when you become a manager, they tell you never to do, or if you do it, not to be caught, is, is uh, do as I say, not, not as I do. So leading by example, I <laughs> see you not. Um, and we figured it's actually a lot more credible, and again, sharing, sharing things if what we promise to application developers, including our own in, inside the company, is the, is the best since sliced bread, if you use this actually to create, to create uh, their own solution. Um, yeah, and just one thing I mentioned on, on, on build packs, you see here, there's a lot of build packs. So whatever, whatever application language you want to use, um, I bet it's supported by it's supported by cloud application platform. If it's not, 
or for whatever reason you don't like one of the aspects of one of those build packs, you can actually tweak the existing build packs. Um, there's also ones coming from the community or you can create your own language. Um, my colleague actually mentioned one of our customers. Um, they have their own programming language in-house, which obviously is not supported out, out, out of the box. So they created their old, own build pack. Um, build pack is one of those terms that, that sound intuitive um, in, in a way it is. Essentially, this is the magic. So it's a lot of, it's a little bit of scripts infrastructure that you can use to teach cloud application platform of programming languages. So in fact, if you write a piece of code, usually you don't even have to say this is a Java program or this is a C++ program. You just push the source code in, then the system, the system tries to identify oh, which language it is. Worst case, it uses brute force, like let's see what happens if I compile this at C++. Oh, it goes up in flames. Let's see what happens when I use the Java compiler. Ah, that works. Okay, let me remember this one is Java. Um, is it comparable to a source to image? Pardon? Is it comparable to the source to image from Red Hat? Uh, uh, you don't require source to image. Is it comparable to source to image? No, because you don't need the image anymore. So this was developed. In yes and no, right? Because you don't do an image anymore, but in a way from the functionality, you take it and you transform it and you prepare it and then deploy it, yeah, that, that, that's similar. Um, okay, I, you, you heard me say, actually it's funny because I'm not a car guy and I keep talking about cars. <laughs> um, you've seen two approaches we, we talked about. One was the, the pure container approach and one was this um, cloud application platform ap approach that's, that's built on Cloud Foundry. And, just to, to understand this, the spectrum, uh, let's you look at two, ex, two ex, extreme examples. One is you take a factory built car. Um, obviously, that's a lot cheaper. Um, you can just mass produce them. You get them quickly and, and produce them quickly versus a custom made car, which gives you maximum flexibility and, and versatility. So if you want to break a new world record, or if you want to have a car that drives uh, 300 miles per hour or 500 kilometers or whatever per hour, then probably you, you want to go for a custom-made car. And I'm not saying this is better, this is really cool and this is really bad or the other way around. It really depends on the use case and there is actually a gamut of approaches. At the end of the spectrum, there is, a, there is the factory, the standard factory car, which you can modify you can, you know, you can put spoilers or color, tweak the engine. So you have a, you have a lot of flexibility with those. Or you can have a custom made car um, and then see whether you can actually create building blocks so that your handcrafted McLaren or whatever um, isn't a one-off, but it's one out of 100 or so. And then depending on the order, um, you can craft your own. And, and why I'm using this analogy, because if you look at it from an application development perspective, this, the factory build, is what Platform as a Service, what Cloud Foundry, what SUSE Cloud Application Platform do. And this custom-made is what you do when you have a command line or make files or Kubernetes, um, in a way. And obviously, you can enrich Kubernetes with additional bits and pieces to, to bring you more to something that's common, that's suitable for mass production. Um, and if you want, you can take, um, you can tweak, you can tweak the build packs, you can tweak your applications and, and e even in a, in a Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry approach. And that's what I'm trying to de depict here. There's not definitely not one answer, but there's also not two answers. There's not like pure Kubernetes here, uh, platform as a service, through the cloud application platform there. There is a, there is a spectrum. Um, and you decide what's important. Do you want to have a absolute control, absolute flexibility? That's more the Kubernetes approach. Or do you really want to, to have very quick 
maximum uh, speed turn times, really reduce things, um, and have automation in place. I'm not saying this is good or this is bad or the other. I'm saying there is a spectrum, and depending on what you need and what you have in terms of money and time and colleagues, um, so fingers on the keyboard, um, there may be different options to, to pick. And if there is one slide, really, um, I, would, I would propose you take away. So if there's one slide from this presentation, is actually this one. Because the way we, we facilitate, and this is really uh, something that uh, happened in like a year, two years ago, roughly, in the time horizon, is um, we really re looked at at the spectrum from an application perspective and said, okay, how can we have one solution that serves this whole spectrum? And that's when we redesigned um, cloud application platform. Um, and, and the new design, which actually other vendors in the industry are starting to look at, um, and at least one is following us here, is to containerize everything, as I mentioned. So you have Kubernetes, as the, as the complete runtime. And then you have, you have Cloud Foundry platform as a service put into containers itself and the workloads that you put on obviously are running into containers. But where you desire so, um, you can bring your own containers. So outside of the realm of platform as a service, where you have absolute control, you can bring your containers, you can deploy uh, life cycle manage it however you want. Um, and you don't do that in two environments where you have your container environment and your platform as a service environment, but it's one environment where you can actually connect the pieces. And that's, a, that's the cool thing. So you decide, do I put this into the automation standard engine? Do I handcraft this? And then do I connect that? How do I connect that? So a bit more detail, it looks like um, you have here the platform. Here is the whole, this is Cloud Foundry put into containers um, with the whole um, CI, CD, brokers, networking, logging, etc. cetera. Um, and then here you have, have the actual workloads that are also running in containers. And here on the other side, bring your own containers wherever you have them from. Some application vendors start providing containers. You can just drop them in and, and via the appropriate connections, your workloads can actually connect to the containers. One example um, that we're seeing is your database. Just take MariaDB, Redis, MongoDB, whatever you want deploy them on the container side, and then your applications, actually your workloads that you develop in-house, have access to that. Or here's SUSE Enterprise Storage, that's based on Ceph, is another, um, that software-defined storage, um, can, also, can also connect to that. And we are, in fact, working to containerize that, so run it as containers, at which point it would, it, it would mo move over here to so it's really this absolute flexibility you have. It's a flexibility of where your software, how your software runs, but then also where do you run it? Do you want to run it on bare metal, virtual machines, your private cloud infrastructure, say OpenStack or VMware, um, or public cloud? So you can, you, you, and still you, you, can, you can have this on, on either end. And one thing that came a little bit, at least to me, I will admit, I'm supposed to be the forward-looking person, but I was a little surprised how strongly that came. Um, where actually um, was Kubernetes as a service in public clouds. So which is now, in fact, one of the primary use cases that we see people interested in and use is, I don't go to Amazon and buy virtual machines or um, Microsoft or Google. I go there and buy Kubernetes as a service and then run to the cloud application platform there and then either bring my own containers, which I still can do, or I use the services that um, one of the 10,987 whatever services that Amazon, for example, offers. Um, 
and connect them that into my infrastructure, which means um, containers actually, and that's really where they live up to the promise. Containers give you the absolute freedom. Do you do it on-premise? Do you do off-premise? Um, how do I develop my software? Where, how, how do I life cycle that? And um, what SUSE Cloud Application Platform actually also brings is a user interface uh, called Stratos. So everything cloudy, of course. Where you see you can run it, um, you can run things in the SAP Cloud if you could, or on, on CAS platform, or other, uh, wherever you want, and have management of multiple clouds. So depending on the workload, or depending on the connections you want between the workloads, you have the, you have the full power to connect those things. And that's really, finally, this, this multi-cloud heterogeneous um, is, is, coming, is coming alive because it's something, hybrid cloud, something that I've heard people talk about for many, many years, but I've rarely seen in action and, and firmly believe now with Kubernetes establishing itself as the common platform that more and more runs on, the common infrastructure platform, I think finally... Um, there is an approach across the industry, regardless of which cloud service provider you pick, regardless whether you do it on-prem or not, that, that allows for that. Yeah, so to summarize, if, if you look at application delivery, um, I believe it's really the speed and agility that, that's key. Um, and and containers, and on the one hand, Kubernetes to some extent, though it's a little lacking in terms of the higher level functions, but really platform as a service, and something like SUSE Cloud Application Platform um, are probably the best answer to get to that agility, unless you want to do everything yourself, which sometimes may be a fair approach. Um, what's really key, and I see this in-house because I've been working with, at SUSE we had hundreds of engineers, and, and my team was responsible, my old team was responsible for driving, driving them via requirements. Um, if you are not efficient operationally, then there's not a lot of bang we get for a buck because then more and more of the internal teams actually focus on operations and there is fewer features I got <laughs> from a product management perspective. So my interest always was, even though I wasn't running engineering, how can we increase efficiency internally so that we can focus on what the customers see, which is, is applications, which is, is, is the software that they really want to use. And, and last but not least, um, I firmly believe, and I've been working in, in this industry for 16 years now, um, I believe that open standards and in fact open source um, are absolute key for for a healthy, longer-term success. Because it's the open source communities that, that keep driving innovation. Look where innovation in software is coming from now. It's, um, Kubernetes is open source. I mean, Linux has established. My cell phone runs Linux. My, my notebook runs Linux. Um, most of the web shops you probably are using run Linux. And I think Amazon... Um, no, Azure is actually close to, to having 50% of all images on Amazon running our Linux M images. Did you say Amazon? I'm, I keep, I mean Azure. So the Microsoft Cloud has exceeded 40% of images running on Microsoft's Cloud or Linux images. So I firmly believe that open standards such as Kubernetes, such as Linux, such as Cloud Foundry, where you have uh, communities around it, not just one vendor, um, are, are key for us to, to break through, uh, through lock-in. And ultimately, because there is no lock-in or very little lock-in, um, lead, lead to success on a commercial perspective for everyone. Um, and apart from that, personally, I just like the open source approach, which is about communities and working together.